friends, and welcome to Understanding Daniel, an in-depth, verse-by-verse study of the prophetic book in the Old Testament called the Book of Daniel. We want to welcome those who are joining us online across the country and around the world. We also want to welcome those who are here for our Sabbath school class, our study class together. I know a number of you have been kind of following on week after week, and so we're glad you are here. Today, we find ourselves in Daniel chapter 2. In our previous presentation, we covered the first half of Daniel 2, and so we're going to continue a little bit more, and we're going to deal with the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had that's recorded in Daniel chapter 2. So we're getting to some interesting details as we get into our study. But before we get to the Word, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be able to study together. Thank you for your Word. Thank you for this important passage that we find in the book of Daniel that lays the foundation for understanding and interpreting of Bible truth. So bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A little bit of the background as we lead up to where we're going to be starting today. The date was 605 BC, 605 years before Christ. The Babylonian armies had come and surrounded the city of Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar was the king, or he was soon to be the king. His father was still in uh, Babylon, but on this campaign, when Nebuchadnezzar surrounded Jerusalem, he was acting on behalf of his father. Then his father died, and he had to hurry back to Babylon. He surrounded Jerusalem, took the city, and uh, took a number of the uh, Hebrews captive, especially those who had potential to be trained in the way of the Babylonians and maybe come back and serve as regent governors on behalf of the Babylonian king. So Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they were taken captive, and they were taken back to Babylon. Now you'll remember in our study of Daniel chapter 1, they were assigned to the royal college to be trained for key positions in the Babylonian empire. And remember how they refused to eat the food that had been placed before them. And God honored them for their simple diet and rejecting the rich foods that the king ate. And they were shown to be wiser than those who ate from the Babylonian table. So that's Daniel chapter 1. So now you have Daniel and his friends. For three years they are in the court being trained to be so-called a wise man, to be involved in counseling and governing in the nation. And then we get to Daniel chapter 2, and in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. This is near the end of uh, Daniel and his friends training there in the Babylonian court. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he wakes up, and he's deeply impressed by the dream, but he can't quite remember the details of the dream. God gave him the dream, but then made it so that he couldn't fully understand it, and yet he felt Remember the details of it, and yet he felt deeply impressed that there was some significance to the, de- the dream. And we understand this because back in Babylonian culture, a much emphasis was put on the communication from the gods to man, because they believed in all kinds of different pagan deities. And one of the ways of communication, they believed, was through a dream. And especially the dream came to the king. Perhaps it was the god, or one of the gods, trying to communicate with the pagan So he felt really important. He felt as though he needed to understand this dream. It was important. He wanted to know what this was about. So Nebuchadnezzar the king called for his wise men. They came and stood before the king. And he said, I want you to tell me this dream. Well, they said, oh, king, tell us your dream and we'll give you the interpretation. Now, you probably know that's pretty easy. If the king tells you what he dreams, then you just make up something that sounds good, right? But in this case, the king couldn't quite remember the details of the dream. He said, I want you to tell me the dream then I know you can give me the interpretation. Well, impossible. How is anybody to say what somebody else dreamed? Of course, the wise men, they said to the king, this is impossible. Well, the king got very angry because they claimed to have contact with the gods. And here they were shown that they didn't really have contact with the gods. They couldn't tell the king his dream. He got so angry, feeling that this was such an important dream, that he ordered a death decree for all of his wise men in the kingdom. Now, because Daniel and his friends were at the tail end of their training there in the royal college, they were not initially invited to come before the king. However, they were included in the death decree that was issued. And so you have the captain of the king's guard rounding up the wise men, and he comes to the home of Daniel and his friends. And Daniel says, what's going on? And the captain explains the situation. Well, Daniel then asks if he could go before the king, and he does. He goes before Nebuchadnezzar the king, and probably because... Um, Nebuchadnezzar recognized that Daniel was such an excellent student and such a valuable part of the training that was taking place there. He gave him a second chance because Daniel said, just give us some time 
and we'll make known to you the dream and its interpretation. So Daniel went home that night, and he told his three friends about the situation, and they had a heartfelt prayer meeting. And they prayed, and you can have the prayer recorded where they prayed and said, Lord, please reveal this to us. And then after the prayer, they must have had peace in their heart that God is going to take care of them because Daniel goes to sleep. And that night, he has the same dream, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had had, plus the interpretation of the dream. It all occurs that night. So in the morning, he wakes up, he knows what the king dreamed, he knows the interpretation of the king's dream, and so you have recorded in Daniel chapter 2 where Daniel praises the God of heaven for revealing the dream. And that's kind of where we start up our study today. We're in verse 23 of Daniel chapter 2. So this is after Daniel has received the dream and the meaning. He understands what it is. He is praising God. Verse 23 says, I thank you and praise you, O God, my Father. You have given me wisdom and might and have made known unto me what we ask of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. Here Daniel recognizes that the revealing of the dream was in answer not only to his fervent prayers, but also to the prayers of his three friends. Notice how he includes, you have made known, made known to us the king's demand. So he's recognizing the contribution of his friends. Psalms 118, verse 5 and 6, it says, I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. That's a promise we can claim. Is the Lord on your side? If you're on the Lord's side, the Lord is on your side. If you've chosen Jesus, he's on your side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Amen? Amen. Jesus said, do not fear those who can kill the body, but rather fear him that can destroy both body and soul. Meaning, if we ought to fear, we to have that reverence, that awe for our creator God. That's really what's important. All right, then verse 24, moving on. It says, therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said to him thus, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. In other words, stop the death decree. Apparently, it seems as though they were able to catch this in time before all of the wise men were actually put to death. They were being round up to be put to death. So none of them had been, had been put to death just yet. So Daniel, filled with the merciful spirit of Christ and grateful that his prayer had answered, interceded on behalf of the other wise men so that they would not be put to death. How ironic that later we have wise men. That's not the same wise men. It's different wise men because it's during the time of a different king. Different wise men who were jealous of Daniel's position. They made plans to have him thrown into the lion's den. You have that story in Daniel chapter 6. But instead of destroying Daniel, the evil plans ended up being the means of their own destruction. So here you have Daniel interceding for the wise men, but you find wise men trying to get rid of Daniel. And something else that's interesting about this is the same wise men that were delivered here in the story, they are the ones on the plain of Dura that went and accused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to study that in Daniel chapter 3. So they weren't very appreciative of the work that Daniel had done. But talking of Daniel, Daniel chapter 6, it says in verse 1, it pleased Darius or Darius to set over the kingdom 120 saprits to be over the whole realm. Now Darius was a Persian or Medo-Persian empire. He was the ruler at the time. Babylon had already fallen. It's kind of interesting that you have Darius who's on the throne, conquers Babylon, but there is another King Darius some 200 years later, king of Persia, different man, same name, But Darius now is conquered by Alexandra in the battle of Arbella in 331. Same same name, different king. But here's Darius, and it says that um, Daniel was placed. He distinguished himself, verse 3, above all the governors. And so the governors and the satraps, they sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. They were jealous of the power that Daniel had. And you remember the story, they went to the king... And they said to the king, we want to make you, we want you to be the only one to whom everyone is to ask for anything. And uh, the king kind of liked the idea. Verse 8 says, now, O king, establish the decree and sign it in writing that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the writing or the written decree. And that was that if anybody did not worship or request permission from the king, For anything, they would be thrown to the lion's den. Of course, Daniel prayed to God, and you know how God delivered him. All right, so here Daniel is showing kindness to the wise men, but the wise men do not always show kindness back to Daniel and his friends. Verse 25. 
It says, Then Arioch, captain of the king's guard, quickly brought Daniel before the king and said to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. Arioch says, I have found a man. Well, in reality, Daniel had already appeared before the king the day before and asked the king to give him some time. But here Darius is, or rather, Arioch is wanting to claim the glory for himself. In the providence of God, Daniel was brought before Nebuchadnezzar so that the king could become acquainted with the true God, the one who rules over the kingdoms of the earth. Verse 26, the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Now here we find Arioch, as we mentioned a little earlier, he appears to take credit for finding somebody that could interpret the dream for the king. He possibly was unaware of Daniel's previous meeting with the king the day before, when the, king was, when the king granted him time, the king addressed Daniel using his Babylonian name, which is Belteshazzar. However, Daniel always refers to himself as Daniel. He never uses his Babylonian name. We do find Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being mentioned in Daniel chapter 3, which was written by Daniel. But whenever Daniel wrote of himself, he would refer to himself by his Hebrew name, not his Babylonian name, which is interesting. All right, verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of king and said, The secret thing, or the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. Before Daniel even got into the dream and its meaning, he wanted to impress upon the king the foolishness of him trusting in his wise men. He declared that it was beyond the power of the astrologers, the soothsayers, the magicians to reveal the king's dream, and that the king should not be angry with them nor put confidence in their vain superstitions. Okay? Verse 28, then he says, but there is a God in heaven. Here you have Daniel standing before the powerful monarch, Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of the world. And he says, there is a God in heaven, unafraid, willing to declare the truth. Now Daniel says, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be, notice the next two words in the, what does it say? At the latter time or the latter days. So this prophecy goes all the way to the time of the end. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed are these. And now he begins to recount the dream. Daniel now turned the king's attention to God, the God of heaven, who alone can reveal the future. He did not hesitate to acknowledge the source of all of, he did not hesitate to acknowledge the source of his wisdom. It was God. In God's name, he made known the heaven sent messages of instruction, warning, and rebuke which were given not only to Nebuchadnezzar, but to the people of all nations right up to the end of time. What makes the Bible different from any other uh, religious book? It's because it's got the seal of God through prophecy. Prophecy is evidence of its divine origin. No other book has the prophecies as the Bible does, that we can look at history and see how accurately it has been fulfilled. Only the true God knows the end from the beginning can make it known. It sets the Bible apart from any other book. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10. For I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all of my pleasures. So God claims to reveal the end from the beginning. If you want to know the way the story ends, look to the Bible. God will reveal it in his word. Okay, so here we get it closer to the dream, verse 29. It says, as for you, O king, thoughts came into your mind while on your bed about what will come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. Now you can just imagine the scene in your mind. Here's Nebuchadnezzar sitting on his beautiful throne and the wise men are standing by and his counselors and Daniel is standing before the king. And he begins by saying, king, you were thinking about the future of your kingdom just before you fell asleep. Now, how does anyone know what somebody else is thinking just before they fall asleep? So immediately that gets Nebuchadnezzar's attention, kind of leans forward on his throne. Well, sure enough, I was thinking about my kingdom and what was going to happen in the future. So Daniel has his full attention. And then he begins to give the details. So Daniel began by reminding the king of his waking thoughts before having the dream. And as it dawned on the king that Daniel's God was able to reveal to Daniel his own secret thoughts, his confidence in Daniel's ability to tell the dream and its meaning was strengthened. The Hebrew captive had already revealed more to the king than all of the other wise men of his realm. 
He already revealed to the king, you were thinking about future things. His wise man couldn't even do that, let alone the dream and its interpretation. Verse 30. But as for me, Daniel says, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. Now here we see the humble spirit of Daniel. How easy it would have been for him to take the glory to himself for being able to reveal the king's dream. But right from the very beginning, he said, it's the God of heaven that reveals the secrets. And this has not been revealed to me because I am wiser and better than anyone else. It has been revealed so that God could reveal to you, the king, what shall be at the time of the end. And that, you know, you can see the, the folly of the wisdom of your wise man in comparison to the wisdom given by the true God. So this is what's been described. Once more, Daniel directs all praise to the God of heaven, the true source of wisdom. He wants to leave no doubt in the king's mind that the God of heaven is making known the future to the king, and it's not man. Verse 31. Now we get to the dream. Daniel begins by saying, You, O king, watched, and behold, a great image, the great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. Now, right away, as Daniel begins to explain to the king what he dreamed, well, the king's really listening, right? <laughs> Suddenly, as Daniel begins to say, your king saw this great image, it comes back to the mind of the king. Sure enough, that's exactly what I dreamed. I saw this great image. Here we have a representation of the image, this great image. Now, of course, the Babylonians that worshipped these very impa- the various pagan deities, image worship was a very important part of how they proved their loyalty to their gods. So to see a giant image in your dream means something. That's why Nebuchadnezzar was so anxious to know the meaning of the dream. He sees this giant image made up of all different kinds of metals. All right. A giant image was an object which would at once command the attention of Nebuchadnezzar as a worshiper of Babylonian gods. Image worship was essential in his religion. Verse 32. The image's head was a finer gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and its thighs were made of brass. Well, you can see a picture of it right here. We've got the head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron. And it might be difficult for you to see, but we have feet made of iron and clay. Now, a couple of things I just want to point out before we keep going here with our study. Just a couple of things, some observations that we find by looking at the image that was revealed in the dream. First of all, you've got one head, but when it comes to the chest and arms, you've got two arms, something to bear in mind. And then when it comes to the legs, you've got two legs. Now that's significant because as we study further, we see that the chest and arms of silver actually represent two powers working in cooperation with one another to bring the downfall of Babylon, Medo-Persia. And just as you typically will have one arm stronger than the other, if you're right-handed, your right arm is a little stronger than your left, other way around if you're left-handed. Just as you have the one arm stronger than the other, so you had the Medo Empire at first coming to power. The Persian came later, but the Persian power grew to dominance and really became the main power near the end of the rule of of Persia. So two parts, Medo-Persia, but the one grew stronger than the other. Persia grew stronger than Media. And then, of course, we have the belly and thighs of brass. We're going to talk about Greece, Alexander the Great a little later on. The legs of iron represent Rome. And just like you have two powers by the arms, you have two powers represented by the legs, pagan Rome and papal Rome. And we'll get to that a little later, especially as we talk about the feet, iron mixed with clay. So very interesting. So here's kind of what he sees in his dream, this great image. Now, um, this dream was perfectly adapted to impress a vital truth upon the mind of Nebuchadnezzar. Besides outlining the leading political powers throughout history, that would impact the people of God. The dream illustrated the worthlessness of earthly pomp and kingly glory. Inferior metals would follow the head of gold until a stone would dash the entire image to pieces, grinding it to power, and then the wind would blow it away. Now, from a human perspective, out of these various metals, gold, of course, would be the most valuable. You've got silver, which is valuable, bronze, valuable, iron, but each less valuable, and then you get to the feet, iron and clay, where clay is not that valuable, but then you have a stone that comes and strikes the image upon its feet. Well, a stone, as far as its value, with reference to gold or silver or bronze or iron, not very valuable. But in heaven's eyes, 
the gold is not valuable, the stone, I mean the, the, the silver is not valuable, but that which is the most valuable is considered the least valuable by man, but the most valuable by God. What's the stone that comes and strikes the image? Represents the second coming of Christ, the establishment of the heavenly kingdom. So from heaven's perspective, what the earth values is upside down. They need to be valuing the stone more than the gold. Are you with me? But from earth's perspective, it's the gold that's more valuable than the stone. So God is revealing to Nebuchadnezzar what is of true value. And he gets into that in the explanation as we get into our study. All right. Talking about the legs, verse 33. It says it's legs of iron. Mentioned that. It's feet of, of iron and partly of clay. Now in Bible times, talking about the clay, clay was often used to mold iron tools and objects. Thus the feet of iron and clay can symbolize powers working together, the one shaping or controlling the other. This was seen in the history of the union of church and state when the papacy controlled the political powers of Europe. So we're talking now about the feet of iron and clay. The iron would represent more of the civil power, the ruling power. The iron is a symbol of the sword. The clay would represent more of a religious power. And as mentioned, you can't really mix clay and iron. They don't mix. But what was used in old Bible, in Bible times is they would make a mold out of clay and they would pour the melted iron into the mold. And so it was the clay that was molding the iron. The clay was influencing the iron. That's important. The clay in the feet of iron and clay represents the papal power or the religious church. It was the religious power that was molding or shaping the political powers of Western Europe. It was the Pope who was influencing the kings of Western Europe. And we're going to see that as we get into our study a little bit more. And now verse 34, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. So suddenly the stone comes flying through the air and dashes this image right on the feet. So the stone in the dream, of course, symbolizes Christ. Jesus said, don't miss this, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Now the stone that the builders rejected is a reference to who? Jesus. And then Jesus goes on and he says, and whoever falls on this stone will be broken. Now who is the this stone in the verse? Whoever falls upon this stone, that's Jesus, that's the stone that the builders rejected. Whoever falls upon this stone will be broken, meaning our hearts will be broken. But notice the next part, but whomsoever it falls, it will do what? It will grind him to powder. What passage of scripture is Jesus thinking about or referencing when he says, if you don't fall on the stone, the stone will fall on you. And if the stone falls on you, it will do what? It will grind you to powder. He's thinking about Daniel too. Are you with me? So he's telling his people back in those times, he's telling them, think of what the prophet Daniel said. The stone represents the kingdom. I am the stone. That prophecy was of me coming to establish a kingdom, first a spiritual kingdom, and then later here, talking about the kingdom of glory that Christ came to establish. Verse 35, moving on. So the stone comes and strikes the image upon its feet. It says, then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together. And became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The stone strikes the, mount, strikes the image, destroys the various metals. The wind blows away whatever's left. The stone grows and fills the whole earth. The stone in the dream symbolizes the establishment of God's kingdom of glory. When the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, then he shall reign forever and ever. That's a quote from Revelation chapter 11. Verse 36. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. So you can imagine in your mind's eye, Daniel standing before the king. He tells the king exactly what he dreamed. The king is reminded clearly of his dream. And now he's sitting on the edge of his seat, just staring at Daniel, saying, that's it, that's it, that's what I dreamed, that's what it is, you have the stone, what does it mean, what does it mean? So he's got his full attention. And now he begins to unfold this mystery, just amazing. Moving on, confidently Daniel declared to the king his dream. And now, with the king's full attention, he proceeds to give its meaning. 
Before Nebuchadnezzar's astonished eyes in 10 amazing verses recorded for us in the Bible, containing only 340 words, God, through his faithful prophet, revealed the major political changes in the world's future from the time of Babylon all the way up to the second coming of Christ. This is a remarkable passage of Scripture. Verse 37, You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. So, begins with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the king represented by the head of gold. But Daniel wants to make it clear to the king that it's the God of heaven that has given Nebuchadnezzar the kingdom. It was not his own might. It was not his pagan deities. It was not Marduk, the god that was worshipped in Babylon. But it was the God of heaven that allowed Nebuchadnezzar to gain this power and this influence and to build up his kingdom. You are the head of gold, he says, but the kingdom was given to you by the God of heaven. The head of gold in the image represents the kingdom of Babylon. The kingdom's capital was a beautiful city, beautiful city of Babylon, which contained magnificent temples, palaces, and gardens. The river Euphrates, which flowed diagonally through the city, provided plenty of water for the irrigation of fields and gardens. The periods of Babylon's supremacy was from 605 BC until about 539 BC, when it fell the night of Belshazzar's feast, recording Daniel chapter 5. And Cyrus conquered Babylon. Next verse, verse 38. And wherever the children of men dwell and the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, he, that's the God of heaven, has given them to your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Now, Nebuchadnezzar represents a kingdom. The head of gold represents the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, that is Babylon. It's not just Nebuchadnezzar, but it's the kingdom Nebuchadnezzar re uh, represented. Something else I want to try and make clear is that notice that there's no break between the various metals. You've got the head of gold immediately followed by the chest knobs of silver. The head of gold is the kingdom of Babylon. Babylon was conquered by Medo-Persia. There was no gap. The night Babylon fell was the night that Medo-Persia took control. And Greece conquered um, Medo-Persia or conquered Persia, Rome. There's no big gap. And the reason this is important is because there is some who try to divide up the image. They try to separate the image from the ankles, from the feet, and they try to put in a 2,000-year gap between the ankle and the foot. The reason being is because if you follow as revealed in Scripture, it begins to identify who the clay represents, the Antichrist power that dominated the nations of Western Europe. And that's why they would create that gap and say the Antichrist power is not what's been revealed here in the book of Daniel, but rather it is a power that is arise in the future. It was, a, it was a diversion tactic, you might say, to lead people away from the Bible. But if you look at the way it's given in the dream, one metal follows the other. One kingdom is followed by the other kingdom. There is no break all the way through to the second coming of Christ. It is a full overview of world history from 605 B.C. all the way down to the second coming of Christ. It's all laid out in this chapter. All right. So Daniel informed Nebuchadnezzar that the God of heaven had given him his kingdom and made him ruler over all. The prophet again directs the king's attention to the Hebrew God, who is the true king. He is king of kings and lords of lords. He is the head of gold. But verse 39, verse 39, Daniel 2, 39. But after you, Daniel says, shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Now we know what that kingdom is. What kingdom conquered Babylon? It was Medo-Persia. Now it's interesting to mention that Babylon is mentioned specifically by name in the book of Daniel. Medo-Persia is mentioned specifically by name, and Greece is mentioned specifically in Daniel chapter 8 by name. So the first three kingdoms, there's no guesswork. The Bible actually tells us who these powers are. It's pretty evident that the power that conquered Greece was Rome. So there's no doubt as to who the legs of iron uh, represent as well. So God is making it very, very clear for us. We can see the train of history as we go through this time. Okay. After you shall rise another kingdom inferior to yours, and then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all of the earth. So we have Medo-Persia and Greece. Babylon was captured with all of its walls and gates still intact. Cyrus, the king of the Medo-Persian Empire, diverted the waters of the river Euphrates into artificial lakes. And on a night when the Babylonians least expected it, he marched his men along the riverbed under the massive walls and into the city. In one night, the kingdom of Babylon was brought to its knees. Of course, we have the account of that recorded for us over here in Daniel chapter 5. I'll just read here verse 
30 and 31, Daniel 5, it says, That very night Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, or the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years of age. So Medo-Persia worked together to bring about the downfall of Babylon and Belshazzar the king. Now, of course, the conquering of Babylon by Cyrus, who was the leader, you have Darius and Cyrus, they worked together, uh, the conquering of Babylon by Cyrus was actually another prophecy that had been given about 150 years before the event occurred by the prophet Isaiah. Now you'll recall, as from previous studies, Jeremiah the prophet was the prophet who was in Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar conquered the city. He was actually a contemporary. He was there at the time. He, was, he knew Daniel. Daniel knew Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah didn't come to Babylon with those who were exiled but he stayed in the area of Babylon, went to Egypt, it's believed, for a period of time. But Jeremiah was around that time period. Isaiah lived before Jeremiah, and it's believed that Isaiah was put to death by Manasseh, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah had a couple of more sons, and then you have the fall of Jerusalem. So Isaiah is about 150 years before the events that he prophesied. And we find that in Isaiah 45, you might want to write this down, Isaiah 45, 1-4, we have this amazing prophecy written 150 years before it occurred. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, actually mentions him by name, whose right hand I have held to subdue the nations before him and to loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. So ye have the prophet Isaiah, this is Isaiah 45 verse 1, writing down how Cyrus, that he mentions by name, will conquer Babylon talks about the gates will not be shut, the gates flowing under the gates that were supposed to go down into the river. Verse 2, I will go before you, I will make the crooked place straight, I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the irons, the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of the secret places that you might know that I, the Lord, call you by name. And then it goes on, I am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and for Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. Now, according to this prophecy, Isaiah, of course, at the time of the fall of Babylon, Daniel was still alive. Daniel knew concerning this prophecy written by Isaiah. He also knew that based upon a prophecy written by Jeremiah, the Babylonian captivity would be for 70 years. So that prophecy met its fulfillment. Babylon fell. Cyrus is now the king. Daniel, most likely, brings a scroll of Isaiah the prophet, opens it to chapter 45. They didn't have chapters there, but opens it to this passage, points to this verse and says, Cyrus, your, your majesty, here is your name. And it says, I will call you by name and you will send my people back. And then suddenly we find Cyrus giving a decree to allow the Jews to go back and restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So it was actually a fulfillment of what Isaiah the prophet had written. It met its perfect fulfillment. So you have Jeremiah saying 70 weeks or 70 years of Babylonian captivity. You have Isaiah saying that it would be Cyrus that would conquer Babylon. All of that is portrayed well in advance. Just amazing. Okay, moving on. Still the same verse, by the way, talking about the silver. It says, as the silver is inferior to the gold, so Medo-Persia, the Medo-Persian Empire, was inferior to that of the Babylonian Empire. It covered less territory and was less extravagant in culture and art and construction. Medo-Persia held world supremacy from 539 B.C. until the Battle of Arbela in 331 B.C. The belly and the thighs of brass symbolized the kingdom of Greece. Alexander the Great conquered the Persians at the Battle of Arbela in 331 B.C. His Greek soldiers were noted for their brazen armor. Their helmets, shields, and battle axes were made of brass. The empire of Greece ruled until 168 B.C. So the prominent metal that was used by the Grecians was brass. The prominent metal used by the Romans was iron. So you can even see in the description giving, given a connection to the empire that the metal represented. So the kingdom of brass represents Alexander the Great, who warred against Persia. Interesting, I'm actually reading a book on the life of Alexander. He was a very interesting character. He was early 20s. His father, Philip, was assassinated before his eyes. He believed that um, he was ordained by the pagan deities, by the pagan gods, to rule the world. And so he set out with an army, and um, he was an expert in military tactics, and he was able to 
first of all, originally he's from Macedonia. Alexander's from Macedonia. He spread out into the Grecian Empire, uh, took over different key cities in Greece, built up a military, and then they went out against Darius, who was the Persian king. There was a massive showdown that occurred in a place called Arbella, where the Persian king Darius had all of his men from across his empire. He had elephants in the battle. And he had Alexander with his horsemen and his, his foot soldiers, and uh, through some military tactics, Alexander actually uh, conquered uh, the Persians at that battle. He didn't kill Darius the king at the battle in 331. Darius fled, and it took a little while later that uh, eventually he was put to death. Darius was actually not killed by Alexander. It was killed by one of his own servants, who then fled, and it was at a time when Alexander was coming. It was part of a battle when he was surrounding and, and closing in on Darius. So interesting history there. But one other interesting thing. Babylon fell to Medo-Persia without a battle. The military came in under the walls, conquered the city. When it came to Alexander taking Babylon, the Babylonians, as Alexander was advancing, they sent out their representative and they basically handed over the city of Babylon to Alexander. So again, there wasn't a battle involved in the actual taking of the city of Babylon. They just turned it over to Alexander. And so the city continued. All right, a little bit of the history there. Verse 40, moving on. It says, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything like iron that crushes. The kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. Talking of Rome. The legs of iron in the image symbolize the iron monarchy of Rome, which conquered the Greeks in 168 BC and enjoyed world supremacy till about 476 AD. It was a Roman ruler, Pontius Pilate, that at the, insist the insistence of the Jewish leaders had Jesus crucified, because Jesus came during the rule, the reign of Rome. Verse 41, whereas you saw the feet and toes, Partly of potter's clay. Now this is where I want you to pay attention. Partly of potter's clay. What type of clay? Potter's clay and partly of iron. The kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with the ceramic clay. So we get to the feet. We have 400s. Uh, you have Rome beginning to crumble. The various tribes coming in, the Germanic tribes coming in from the north, they begin to carve up the territory of Rome. So you have the iron, but you also got some clay. What does that mean? We're going to look at it. When the Roman Empire began to crumble in 476 AD, it was not overtaken by another world power. Instead, it was divided by successive hordes, or invaded by successive hordes of Germanic tribes, which succeeded in carving out permanent territories from the falling empire of Rome. The feet of iron and clay in the image symbolizes these barbarian tribes and their modern counterparts. Now, looking a little bit more at the clay, we understand the iron representing the civil power or the civil authority. But here's a few verses that talk about the clay so we can understand exactly what this clay is. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 3. Jeremiah, of course, a prophet who was a contemporary of Daniel. It says, Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into a, another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Now here in this vision, in this, this uh, message given by Jeremiah the prophet, you've got the potter, you've got the clay. Who does the potter represent in this, in this picture? Represents God. Who does the clay represent? His people, Israel. Well, read on, verse 5, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as... This potter, says the Lord, look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so you in my hand, O house of Israel. So the clay is a symbol of the church. It's a symbol of a religious power. It's a symbol of the people of God. All right, that's the clay. Here's another verse, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you the potter, and all we are the work of your hands. So here you have a religious component talking about the clay and you have a military component talking about the iron. So in the time of the feet, after pagan Rome began to fall, its kingdom was divided up by these ten Germanic tribes that entered in from the north. But it was not just the tribes that controlled the territory. Another power arose, a religious power, that would begin to influence the nations of Europe. Of course, we know this to be the papal power. The Bible makes it clear. 
A parallel passage of this is, of course, Revelation chapter 17, verse 1 and 2. It says, And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits upon many waters. What does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? Represents the church. It says, With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made drunk with the wine of a fornication. So notice you have a religious power, the woman, a church, that is influencing political powers, that's the kings. She is forming an alliance with them. They are being made drunk with her false doctrine, her wine. It's really a description of what we see in the feet of iron and clay. So the clay would represent the religious side, the papal power, that's molding the civil authority represented by the iron. It's a description of what we saw from 538 until 1798 in Western Europe. Okay, verse 42. And as the toes and the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. Now some of these tribes, these ten tribes that came in from the north, they grew strong and expanded their territories, while others remained relatively small and militarily weak. These tribes developed into the modern nations of Western Europe. The Anglo-Saxons, as you know, settled in England, the Franks in France, the Alemanni in Germany, the Burgundians in Switzerland, the Lombards, Italy, Visigoths, Spain, the Suvii in Portugal. But three of the tribes, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, and the Heruli, were completely uprooted, and there is no modern counterpart to those powers. They were uprooted by the little horn power that we're going to read about in Daniel chapter 7. It's the papal powers. The papacy was rising to prominence. Those three powers, which stood in its way, were completely uprooted and removed. So there are no modern counterparts of that. Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, talking about the same thing. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up amongst them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And there was in this horn eyes at the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. So we have a little horn, little power, little king, who uproots three other kingdoms on his rise to power. We'll study this further when we get there. Daniel chapter 7, verse 23, 24, it says, Thus he said to me, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom of the earth. So we have the same thing described under different symbols in Daniel 7. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, that's the fourth kingdom. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom, which shall be different from all the others. It shall devour the whole earth and trample it in pieces. Verse 24, and the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. Those are the ten Germanic tribes, the ten toes, you might say, in the image of Daniel 2. And then it says, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be different from the first and shall subdue three kings. So the history of what was to happen there in Europe, in the Middle East, the world as it was known at that point was all laid out here in Daniel chapter 2. Just amazing. All right, verse, 30, uh, verse 43. And as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere one to another, just as iron does not mix with miry clay or mix with clay. The Roman Empire has been referred to by historians as the Humpty Dumpty of history. You remember the story of Humpty Dumpty? He fell off the wall, all the king's horses, all the king's men. After the fall of Rome in 476, all the king's horses and all the king's men, the generals and the kings of 15 centuries, have failed to put Humpty Dumpty together again. Six notable rulers have tried to unite Europe under one power. This would include Charles, Charles the Main of France, or the Franks in the 8th century, Charles V of Spain in the 16th century, Louis the 16th of France in the 18th century, Napoleon of France in the 19th century, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany in the 20th century, and of course Adolf Hitler in the 20th century. So Europe has always resisted being dominated by one political power. A religious power, yes, but not a political power, which is kind of interesting. Now, here we get even closer to our time. Repeated efforts have also been made to unite Europe through intermarrying between ruling families, especially in the years between 1850 and 1914. These efforts also have failed. The historian Charles Hazen wrote, Europe has always refused to be dominated by a single nation or a single man. Today, we see an attempt to unite Europe using economic incentives like the euro currency and the European Union. How's that going? But the Bible predicts that before Europe can completely unite, her efforts will be interrupted by a great worldwide event. 
So today we see the European Union trying to pull the nations together, but it's not working that great because England or the UK just left using the European Union. So they still haven't been able to pull that continent, that power together there in Europe. Interesting. Verse 44, here's the key. And in the days of these kings, which kings? The kings as we have them described in the feet of iron and clay, when Europe is divided. Some of the nations are strong, some of the nations are weak. During the days of these kings, our time, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to another people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. What's the next universal kingdom that is to come to our earth? It is the second coming of Jesus, right? The kingdom of God. All of history is moving towards the dramatic conclusion when the Son of God will return in power and great glory. The fulfillment of prophecy reveals that we have almost reached the end of human history. Now what I find interesting is when you look at this image, Daniel 2, it begins in 605 BC and it ends with the second coming of Christ. And that goes for 2,600 years, roughly. From there all the way down to the second coming of Christ, about 2,600 years. In the last 2,600 years, every person who has lived have found themselves in one of the metals or one of the images used here. If you were alive in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, you'd be the head of gold. If you're alive during the time of Greece, you'd be um, the, the bronze. If you're alive during the time of Christ, you would be the legs. Today we are living in divided Western Europe. Feet and I, we're right there. Not are we in the feet, I think we're standing at the very tippy toes of the image. We're on the toenails, holding on. Jesus is soon to come. Time is running out. You understand? We're not back here today, friends. We're not during Medo-Persia. We're not during Rome. We're not during the 1260 years of papal supremacy that ended in 1798. We're right in the very tip of the toes. The next event that is to take place is the second coming of Jesus. There is no other world power that's going to dominate the world. It's Jesus coming. It's going to set up a kingdom that will never come to an end. That's the second coming of Christ. That's the good news of Daniel chapter 2. So in summary then, the gold represents Babylon, ruled from 612 to uh, 539 B.C. Um, began in 605, but went to 539. You have Medo-Persia, 539, the fall of Belshazzar to 331. You have Greece from 331 to 168. And then you have Rome, 168 to 476. Now, 476 is not a hard date. It's one that's chosen just because you need to put a date in there. But it took a while for these Germanic tribes to carve out territory within the Roman Empire. But that's the date that's given. And then, of course, you have from 538, which is not listed, until 1798, where you have the clay and the iron together there in Western Europe, right up to the second coming. Verse 45. Inasmuch as you saw the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands. Don't miss that part. A stone that strikes the image is cut out how? Without hands. That's a big clue. The stone is cut out without hands, out of a mountain, and it breaks in pieces. The iron, the bronze, the clay, and the silver, and the gold. Gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. So let's talk about the stone cut out without hands. The stone cut out without a hand represents the establishment of the kingdom of Christ on the earth. We read this in Matthew 21, 43. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you, speaking to the Jews, the Jewish nation, and given to a nation bearing the fruit of it. And whoever falls upon this stone will be broken but on whom it falls, it will grind him to powder. It's a reference to the second coming of Christ. Now here we find Mark chapter 4, verse 58, talking about the stone that was cut out without hands. Mark chapter 14, 58. We heard him say, talking of Jesus, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another one without hands. So when it talks about hands, it's talking about mankind. The temple was made by man, the earthly temple. Jesus is going to say, I'm going to build another temple, the church, not with human hands. Meaning, it's going to be divine. I'm the one that's going to do it. So the stone that is cut out without hands, it's not something man does. It's not something human beings can do. It's something that God is going to do. 
Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, it says, But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with great and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. So a stone not made with hands is a reference to God. Yes. Let me see. You're talking about verse what? 43. Verse 43. I better look this up to see where we're at. Verse 43. Repeated efforts have been made to unite Europe through intermarrying. Oh, good. I'm glad you asked. All right. So during that time, from 1815 through until the beginning of World War I, they tried to unite Europe through intermarrying. I mean, that had worked back in the days of Babylon, Medo, Persia somewhat. They would take, you know, the daughter of some other king and she would marry the ruler or the emperor and to try and hold the king together. A lot of that was being done from 1850 through to World War I, where all of the royalty were in some way related to just about every other royalty in Europe. But all of that failed. Did the war have anything to do with this? Well, after, yeah, when World War I broke out, they realized that was a waste of time. That didn't work. So that's why it goes up to that date. Then you have World War I that kind of brought everything together. So there was, there was a determinate effort to try and um, unite Europe through intermarry. Very good point. Who is the stone that comes and strikes the image? It is Jesus. Jesus is coming to establish a kingdom that will never end. So in Daniel chapter 2, we see the outline of world history. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Western Europe. We see the papal power. The nations of Europe, some are strong, some are weak, but then another kingdom comes, and that's the kingdom of God. Jesus comes, and he establishes a kingdom that will never come to the end. That's where we are. We're right near the end of time. Verse 46, nearing the end, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and prostrated himself before Daniel and commanded that, he should be, that um, they should present an offering and incense to him. The solemn truth conveyed the dream made a deep impression on the king's mind. And in humility and awe, he fell to the ground in worship. Nebuchadnezzar was not worshiping Daniel, but rather worshiping the God of Daniel. Because Daniel spoke about the God of heaven. As he declares, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords. The Bible makes it very clear that we are not to worship any other person. Verse 47, the king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and a revealer of the secret, since you could reveal the secret. The Babylonians had boasted that their conquering of Jerusalem had proven that their gods were superior to the God of the Hebrews. But now Nebuchadnezzar, who called his god Marduk, Lord of the gods, is led to acknowledge Daniel's god as infinitely superior in power and wisdom to all the gods of the Babylonians. Verse 48, Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole realm of province of Babylon and chief administrator of all of the wise men of Babylon. As Joseph, many years before, was promoted to second in command in Egypt because of his interpretation of Pharaoh's dream, so Daniel, in, in response to his interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, was promoted also to be second in the kingdom, to rule over the province of Babylon. In verse 49, as also Daniel petitioned the king, and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his three friends who prayed with him, over the affairs of the province of Daniel, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. To sit in the gate of the king means you fulfill the function of a counselor to the king. He had a higher position. Nebuchadnezzar revoked the decree that would have destroyed all of the wise men of Babylon. At Daniel's request, his three friends that united with him in praying to God for deliverance were also promoted to high positions within the kingdom. By the providence of God, they were given positions of influence in the Babylonian court where they, could stood, where they stood as faithful ambassadors for the true God, the God of heaven. All right, that is Daniel chapter 2. How you all doing? Did you learn something? All right, let's see how much you remember. We've got just two minutes to go through our Q&A, all right? Are you ready? Question number one. Why did Nebuchadnezzar call his wise men to be before him? He was planning a new military campaign. He had a dream that troubled him. He received news of a rebellion in his kingdom, A, B, or C. The answer is B. Number two, what did, king, what did the king want his wise men to tell him? He wanted them to the interpretation of the dream, 
the dream and its interpretation, the reason why he was having dreams, A, B, or C. B, he not only wanted the interpretation, he wanted them to tell him what the dream was. Number three, why did Nebuchadnezzar order the death of all of his wise men? A, he thought that they might be plotting his death. B, he didn't like their interpretation of his dream. C, he realized their false profession of being in contact with the gods. Is it A, B, or C? C, C he realized that they weren't telling the truth. Number four, why were Daniel and his friends not called before the king? Is it A, they were away from Babylon at the time of the king's dream? They were not amongst the wise men who were involved in pagan worship? They didn't speak the language spoken in the royal court. Is it A, B, or C? They were not involved amongst those involved in pagan worship. So the answer is B. B is the answer. They weren't involved in that type of wise men. Okay, verse 5. What reason did Daniel give the king for being able to interpret his dream? Number one, he was the wisest of all of the king's counselors. B, he had spent much time studying dreams and their interpretation. Or C, the true God of heaven had revealed to him the dream and its interpretation. A, B, or C? C. C. He recognized it was God. Number six. What did the king see in his dream? He saw seven fat cows and seven skinny cows. A giant metallic image, a bright light at the end of a tunnel. A, B, or C? Who was the king that saw seven fat cows and seven skinny cows? That was Pharaoh. That was a different story. But Pharaoh, of course, had his dream interpreted by Joseph. Number seven. What did the various metals in the image symbolize? A, successive kingdoms that would impact the people of God until the end of time. The most important wars fought in the Middle East and Europe or the rise and fall of global trade between nations and empires. Was it A, B, or C? The answer is A. All right. Number eight. What is the correct order of the kingdoms symbolized by the image in Daniel chapter 2? Is it A, Rome, Greece, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Europe, Babylon, Rome, Greece, Medo-Persia, Europe, or Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Europe? The answer is C. Okay, very good. Number nine. What do the feet and the toes of iron and clay symbolize? The nations of Western Europe, the nations that have the biggest populations, or the nations that have nuclear weapons? A, B, or C? A. The answer is A. All right, very good. Almost done. What was symbolized by the stone that struck the image in its feet? A nuclear war in Europe. The second coming of Christ, a giant asteroid colliding with the earth. A, B, or C? The answer is the second coming of Jesus. Number 11. What was symbolized by the stone becoming a mountain and filling the whole earth? Did it mean the establishment of a kingdom of God on earth, the beginning of a one world government, or humanity starting a colony on Mars? Is it A, B, or C? A. The answer is A. Number 12. What was Nebuchadnezzar's response to Daniel's interpretation of the dream? He got angry and told Daniel to flee from his presence. Did that happen? He confessed that Daniel's God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. He commanded that sacrifices be made to the Babylonian gods. The answer is B. All right, our last question. Here we go. What happened to Daniel and his friends after the interpretation of the dream? Was it A, they were given permission to leave Babylon? B, they were promoted to high positions in the kingdom, or C, they became Babylonian ambassadors to Egypt. Is it A, B, or C? B. And the answer is B. How did you do? Did you get full marks? All right, very good. In Daniel chapter 2, we can see an overview of world history. It forms the foundation of our study as we continue in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8. We have a solid foundation that we can build on. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to, to study. We can see where we are in the stream of time. That, Lord, things aren't just randomly occurring, but there is a master plan. And we know that things are nearing the end, the glorious conclusion when Jesus comes as King of kings and Lord of lords. Help, Lord, help us to be faithful in our own personal lives, faithful in witnessing to you, for you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll continue with our worship service.